Uh, today's speaker is Joachim Goldberg. He comes to us from Google New York, New York, right? Yeah. Where he's doing uh, his postdoc. Uh, Joachim graduated, I think, two years ago from uh, Ben Gurion University in Israel. Um, and he's also uh, worked at ISI as part of the summer um, research program there, doing machine translation. Uh, he's done a, a bunch of different stuff. Uh, today he'll be talking about parsing. And um, I'm excited to hear this because uh, you guys have probably noticed Google uh, Research has been doing a lot of really excellent work in parsing in the past couple years. So I'm curious to know what you've been contributing there as well. OK, uh, thanks. Um, as Mark said, I'm Yoav Goldberg. Um, I'll be talking about parsing, but I'll start with um, some words about my uh, uh, previous research. Uh, so that's stuff I used to uh, work in. So uh, there is parsing there, lots of um, Hebrew, which may explain my accent, I guess. Um, some model, syntactic, um, grammar, prediction, stuff like that. So it's mostly around uh, NLP and uh, structural reason and, uh, and syntax. Uh, this work will be less about Hebrew, but I hope to do more of that uh, later on. Uh, so basically, the overall goal, as you may know, is uh, NLP. Uh, and what's NLP? It's this uh, process in which you um, take some text, run it into some semi-intelligent process, and get some sort of meaning out of it. Um, and at Google, um, we, have, we do use NLP quite a lot. Um, and there are three main challenges. So one of them uh, is to use NLP in order to actually do something useful. Uh, and for that, you need your algorithms to be accurate. Otherwise, they, they just not work. But on the other hand, you want to apply NLP to uh, big data. So you want things to run really, really fast as well. Okay, so uh, if I have a very accurate but very slow algorithm, uh, it will just not be scalable enough uh, for, for us to run. And then there is uh, one challenge that I uh, have a lot of interest in, which is how to use NLP uh, or how to use big data to improve NLP. Um, and that's very interesting, but not in this talk, although I try to do uh, work in this space uh, for a little. So this work uh, is about parsing. Okay? Um, so what is parsing, in case you don't know, uh, parsing uh, takes a sentence and transforms it uh, into a parse tree. So here is a sentence, uh, and here is a parse tree. Uh, we're working with uh, dependency uh, formalism in which uh, each word uh, in the sentence uh, has a modifier which is a different word. Okay? Uh, so we basically build these um, uh, trees which, are, uh, which have related arcs where each node in the tree um, is a word. And these things can have labels on them, okay? uh, and they do, but I just don't show it here uh, because it's easier to to draw and, and to look at. Uh, and the trees are, alt, are also projective, uh, meaning that uh, no arcs cross over here. Uh, if you don't know what uh, projectivity means, it's OK. It's not very important for this talk, but I will use this term. So if I am using this term, it means that nothing crosses, but you can also ignore it if you don't care about that. Okay? Um, and the reason we do parsing is that it's really a useful uh, signal for various other downstream tasks. So you, uh, in Google, we first parse a sentence, uh, and then we use this uh, as input to some other system. Uh, so it can be used, for example, for uh, entity extraction and resolution, uh, for uh, learning new relations, uh, if you want. Uh, it's good for uh, answer questions or, ans or, or answering queries, which are sort of questions uh, posed in a weird way. Um, voice commands, like, uh, things like uh, Siri or the new uh, Android um, kind of uh, voice command interface, uh, and also translation, uh, where you can, um, if you know what the syntax is, you can translate better. Okay? And the reason uh, we use dependency trees uh, is there um, more natural representation uh, for um, non-linguists or engineers, as I like to call them, uh, to, to work with. Okay? So that's kind of what we're working with. Uh, and currently, there are uh, two main approaches uh, to parsing, or even to uh, just um, such a prediction uh, in general. And the first one, which I'm pretty sure you all know, is uh, global optimization, where you define a scoring function over a sentence in three pairs. Uh, then you uh, search for the best scoring structure. Of course, search is hard, so you need to make some assumption about your uh, scoring function. And if you make it simple enough, uh, then uh, search uh, become simple enough to actually use. 
Okay. Uh, so uh, I will just call that uh, the argmax over some space. Okay. Uh, and then on the other hand, there is this uh, greedy decoding approach, uh, in which you basically start with unparsed sentence, uh, and then you uh, apply locally optimal actions until you are done. Uh, and you never look back. So basically, uh, start here, go there, go there, go there, and then you reach the end and you are done. Uh, no regrets. Um, and that's kind of a very simple heuristic thing. Just do the best thing that you can uh, at each point. Um, I can call that like, while not done, do the best thing. Okay, so it's kind of, it has a kind of a heuristic uh, flavor over there. Uh, and, well, it is kind of heuristic. Uh, so, Global optimization has some really uh, good selling points. Uh, it's very accurate, or it's the best we have so far. Uh, it's well studied and well understood, and there's really good uh, foundation to it. Like, so we know hypergraphs, we know line programming, we know marginals, um, we know various coding methods. We, there are many things that we know uh, how to do in this uh, um, search-based uh, space. But it is uh, a bit slow, especially if you want to have uh, rich features. Okay? Um, and it's uh, actually a bit too slow for us still, even if we do pawning all over the place. Um, just cannot be scalable enough. On the other side, the, uh, the greedy approach uh, lets you use whatever features you want, so it's very nice. Uh, it is very accurate considering how silly it is, um, and it can be extremely fast. Okay, um, so if you don't do any search, you can just do things in linear time, but also in a very fast linear time. Okay, so it's you do things in place in memory, you don't copy anything. It can be very, very fast. On the other hand, uh, it is still not as accurate as, uh, as uh, search-based methods. Uh, and in particular, it's very, very little understood. Okay, so there is no, not much theoretical work there, so you don't know anything basically about the system. You know that uh, they work very well and you can get them to get you good accuracies, uh, but you don't really understand the systems, okay? So you just don't know why they work as they do, okay? And that's a bit annoying, and we would like, hope to change that. Um, so the main question motivating this uh, work is basically, uh, what's the best we can do with the greedy approach, okay? So I'm not allowed to do search. I'm just doing a greedy uh, inference. Uh, what's the best I can do under this framework, okay? Uh, and for industry, this is very interesting uh, because, well, you can get good accuracies uh, or better accuracies with the same speed, so you can get better results without paying for more machines uh, to do more processing, which is kind of a very measurable thing uh, and a very, and very easy gain uh, to explain. Uh, and for the more um, academic perspective, uh, I like this because it ties in with uh, um, incrementality, which is something I really like. So I would imagine that if you think of how a person will process a sentence, it will be uh, much, much closer to a greedy left to right thing uh, than it is to, uh, say, a global optimization kind of uh, approach. So I'm not saying people are uh, greedy all the way, but it's much closer uh, to this extreme than to the other extreme, and I would kind of like to explore what can be done in this extreme. Uh, it's also a very cool learning problem, like how, what can you do if you are just allowed to learn one action at a time without doing like full-fledged search. Uh, and also, yeah, speed is also something I would like uh, to have. It's nice if your uh, algorithm uh, trains fast and runs fast. Okay? It's, it's useful. So now let's uh, describe how things uh, used to be done uh, when we didn't know how to do them better. So for those of you who uh, have never seen tradition-based parsing before, uh, here is uh, some kind of an overview. It's a bit of a weird story, so bear with me on that one. Uh, so imagine there is like, this abstract machine which is composed of a stack and a buffer, okay? Uh, and uh, this, is, this machine is initialized with the words of a sentence, okay? And then we have a set of actions that um, are applied to the machine uh, and process uh, the world somehow. So they move words from the stack to the buffer, or, or from the buffer to the stack. They uh, attach words to each other and they remove words until at the end you are at a state where you have uh, connected words uh, and an empty stack and buffer, okay? and then you are done. Okay? Uh, and the uh, set of actions that you choose to work with uh, define your system. Okay? So 
uh, there are many possible uh, machines and many possible uh, action sets. Uh, and and uh, if you choose uh, one particular set of action, then you have one algorithm which you can use. <coughs> so let me uh, just describe one system, which is the Arc Eagle system. Okay, so uh, we have four operations. The first one is shift. So here we see uh, the stack drawn uh, in um, in gray and the buffer drawn in uh, white, so you don't see it. Uh, and the uh, shift operation will take the first word in the buffer, which uh, is B in this case, uh, and uh, move it to the stack. So it will look like that. Uh, the left arc action uh, will add an arc between the uh, first element in the buffer and the uh, top of the stack. And we'll also uh, remove the, the top of the stack. So now things which are greater are uh, not there anymore. They're just drawn there for, um, so you can see them, but they're not in the stack anymore. Okay. Uh, the right arc action will do um, a very similar thing. It will connect the top of the uh, stack to the uh, first in the buffer, and will also uh, push um, the buffer into the stack. So we move from here to there. And then there is this, uh, finally, the reduce action, which will just uh, remove the, the uh, first element in the stack, uh, provided it, that it has a head already. Okay, so we are not allowed to run that uh, if there is no head, because then we'll have a, a, a structure with no connection in it. Okay? So these are the, uh, the four actions of the EO system. Uh, and let's see how we can use that to uh, pass a sentence. So here's a simple one, she ate pizza with pleasure. Uh, we f we uh, start by shifting, because that's the only thing we can do. Um, now we do uh, left arc, so that's uh, eight to she. Uh, then we do a uh, shift again. Now we do a right arc, so we get here. Now uh, we could do a right arc and attach uh, pizza to it, but this wouldn't be wrong, okay? So it will not be the good analysis. So instead we uh, do a reduce, and then we do a right arc and then one more, and then we reduce until everything is empty. Okay? And we have a pass, and we have an empty stack and buffer. So that was an example. And now it's a good time to kind of think what we know about this uh, system. Uh, so we know basically three things about it. We know that uh, every sequence of action uh, will result in a valid projective structure. Okay? So uh, we never get a non-projective uh, structure at the end. Uh, we know that every projective tree um, is derivable by at least one sequence of actions. Okay? So we get like uh, soundness and uh, completeness over here. Uh, and uh, very importantly, we know that if uh, someone gives me a tree, a tree I can show uh, a sequence of action that will produce it. Okay? So that's called an oracle. Uh, and uh, these are three essential things we know. Uh, and we know them also for other transition systems. So basically, if you want to pass with some kind of uh, uh, transition system, you need to know these things. Okay? So these are the uh, things we know. And these things are, co are quite uh, useful because we can use them to, to pass a sentence. Okay? Uh, so here is basically our uh, parsing algorithm. Okay? So again, uh, we are we're going to pass uh, she ate pizza with pleasure. Okay? Uh, and we um, start by initializing initializing the sequence from the sentence and the, and the tree. So here is our uh, sequence. Then we initialize the uh, configuration, so empty stack and the buffer over there with all the words. Uh, then, uh, while we're not in the uh, final state, we'll uh, look what the next action is, and then we apply it and move to the next configuration, uh, take the next action from the sequence, apply that, uh, and so on until uh, at the end uh, we are done and we are out of the loop and we return the resulting tree. Okay, so that's the parsing algorithm. Uh, the problem here, of course, uh, is that in order to take uh, the action from the sequence, I need to have the oracle, uh, which is based on the tree, uh, which I usually don't have, so it's not really a good parsing algorithm. Okay, we, I, in order to parse, I need to have uh, the uh, final goal, uh, which is bad. Uh, so what we're going uh, to do is we're going to think, okay, so maybe uh, it might be that there is a connection uh, between the configuration and the action I need to apply. Okay, maybe they are related uh, somehow. I think it's a good assumption uh, to make, or like a reasonable assumption to make. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, replace uh, our oracle with a classifier. So uh, I'll assume like a linear thing, but you can do whatever. Um, so I have this uh, weight vector W. And then 
what I do is I um, summarize the configuration as a feature vector. So I kind of look at things in the uh, configuration. And then I uh, try to uh, predict uh, what the uh, best action is uh, based on uh, how the, uh, the configuration looks. Okay? Uh, and then the only question is how to learn uh, correct weights uh, for, for my classifier. Um, so um, here is one way to, to learn. So we start uh, with this uh, uh, passing algorithm. We make some space here, uh, and then we add these things uh, between. So basically, what we're going to do here is uh, learn or um, create a uh, training set. So we start with an empty training set. Uh, then we um, run our algorithm as, as usual. Uh, but after we know what the action is, we look at the configuration, extract features, and then add to the uh, training set the features and the action. Okay? And then at the end, we just uh, train a classifier over this training set. Okay? So, that's the, so that's the batch learning algorithm. I don't really like batch learning algorithm, so I will uh, turn that into an online algorithm. This should be uh, quite easy. Okay? So I'll basically uh, replace these lines where I, uh, where I create a training set with some kind of a more the dynamic process. So I um, start with this um, random zero weight vector. Uh, and then I uh, do my thing as usual. Uh, so, but now, after I have my action, I uh, predict using the uh, current vector. Uh, if uh, my prediction is not the gold one, uh, I will update um, based on the features away from the bad one and, uh, and towards the good one, uh, and then return W at the end, or an average W, or whatever you want to do, as uh, kind of a standard online learning stuff. Okay? So I guess this should be uh, sort of familiar, or at least the like, framework should be sort of familiar to, to you uh, by now. Uh, so that's our, uh, our learning algorithm. And after we've learned how to um, like good weights for W, we can just uh, use this to uh, parse new sentences. Okay, so that's how we do uh, parsing. Um, so to summarize, uh, we summarize the configuration by a set of features, and then we learn the best action to take at each configuration, and hope this will generalize well uh, for, uh, for the future. And in fact, it kind of works sort of well. So here are some numbers, or some graph with numbers, on uh, how well we do in English. Uh, so we do uh, quite good um, in domain. We, be, we do slightly worse uh, out of domain if it's a close domain. Uh, we do uh, much worse out of domain if it's uh, like farther away domain, but overall it's quite good. I mean, these numbers are really not that bad. Uh, it, they're kind of meaningless because they're not really compared to anything, uh, but I will compare later. Do you want to? So, so this is all the same parser trend on Wall Street Journal? Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, what would generalization performance look like uh, if you were using uh, a graph-based parser? Uh, the similar trends. Uh, all the numbers will be a bit higher, but it's similar. I mean, they all drop on these ones quite a bit. Um, so I, I don't think there is like any preference to one over the other here. I mean, but all the numbers will be slightly higher. So, uh, and I can, of course, I can also do it for uh, many uh, different languages. Here, I train each language on, on its own. Um, and yeah, again, you can get a bunch of numbers, which I'll compare to later. But uh, these are quite good. Okay. Um, and now let's move on to the new stuff uh, of this presentation. Um, so. We've, we saw that we can do uh, two things. We can uh, learn a parse from data, and we can parse new sentences. Uh, so let's think, uh, talk about at least one thing we cannot do in this framework, uh, and that's uh, parsing with constraints. Okay, so now parsing with constraints uh, is kind of easy uh, if you have a graph-based uh, assertive-based parser, because you kind of just uh, have a smaller search space. But it's kind of hard. Uh, in this framework. Uh, so let me just uh, explain what parsing with uh, constraints means. So let's know that, uh, let's assume that I know that say word uh, 2 uh, is the head of word 7 uh, and word 3 uh, is, the head of, is the head of word 5 or that way around. Uh, and um, I want to have a parse that will incorporate these constraints. Okay, so like give me a good parse but under the condition that uh, word 2 and 7 are connected. Okay. Uh, so how do I do that? Okay. So let's try to see why it's hard. So here are our, our constraints, and here is a naive algorithm uh, that uh, 
may look like it might work, but it doesn't. So uh, the naive one is basically start with our uh, passing algorithm, make some space here, and then add this this guy, which basically means uh, says that okay, so I need to have this constraint. Okay, so yeah, so if I am at a configuration where uh, word two uh, is on the top of the stack, and then uh, whatever is in the buffer, then I can connect them. Then I must connect them, and I do uh, the uh, right action. Uh, if uh, it's other way around and I have word 3 and word 5, then I do the left action. And if it's neither of these, okay, I will just use my uh, classifier. Okay? So this seems that it might work. Of course, it will fail miserably. Uh, and uh, the reason it will fail is that we may actually never reach this configuration. Okay? So if we can connect these two words, we'll do, the, we'll do it. But there is no guarantee that we'll actually reach this thing. Maybe. Uh, some some uh, previous mistake that we made uh, kind of um, just blocked us from from getting there. Okay, so and so that's why this uh, this naive algorithm would not work. Uh, and this is kind of relates to or highlights some of the things that we don't know about the system. Okay, so uh, we do know that they are sound and complete and how to drive an Oracle. Uh, what we do not what we do not know, for example, uh, is what is um, the sets of structure which are reachable from any given configuration. So we know that from the uh, initial configuration, we can reach all of the trees. But once we have um, made some steps, we don't know what is reachable from that step. Okay? Uh, we also don't know how an action will affect the set of reachable structures. Okay? So we uh, take an action, what does it mean? Or like in particular, what does shift mean in this um, context. So I know that like the left arc action uh, will connect to things, so it has an arc, and I know what it does. A shift will just move something from the buffer to the stack, but it has many consequences uh, in terms of arcs that can or cannot be built, or structures that can or cannot be built, but I have no idea what they are currently, which is a bad thing, I would argue. So in order to uh, bridge this kind of knowledge graph, uh, gap, I will uh, introduce um, two concepts, uh, and the uh, first of them would be reachability. Okay, and we'll start with a very easy problem, which, which I called arc reachability. Okay, and, and and that's the problem. Let's say I am at a given configuration, and I want to know is there a sequence of action after which uh, the edge from i to j uh, will be derived. Okay. And that's very easy because it's very easy to uh, construct such a, such a sequence or a prove that it doesn't exist. Let me give you an example. Um, so again, for this arc eagle system, let's say I want um, to add an edge from head to modifier. Okay. So in the easy case, uh, it's uh, already added. Then that's trivial. Right. There is a zero length sequence that can add them. Um, now let's assume that uh, we have now, if, if it's not the case, then we need to be in a state uh, where we have uh, one of them uh, on the buffer, on, on top of the buffer, and the other uh, uh, first on top of the stack. Okay, and then we can add the edge. Okay, uh, and of course the uh, modifier, which could be either this or that, uh, should not have a head yet because otherwise it will uh, violate the uh, the tree constraint. Okay, so we need to get to this uh, configuration. Now, if one of uh, more of the item is uh, is um, is already reduced, so it's not on the stack anymore. Then I cannot do anything. So, it's, so I I cannot add the edge. Uh, if they are on the stack, then I also cannot add because I cannot move back from the stack to the buffer. Okay, so so these are kind of off. Now let's just, uh, assume like one of them is on the stack and the other on the buffer. Uh, then it's easy. I shift until uh, that's the uh, the first in the buffer. Uh, then I do left or uh, reduce until that's on. Uh, of the stack. Of course, wh while I did that, I added many extra edges, which I don't care about. Okay, but that's, let's say it's fine, and then I can add my arc. Okay, so that's kind of uh, one case. Now, uh, the only left, the only case left is um, when they are both on the buffer. But that's easy. Just a shift until I get to this case, which I, which I already solved. And now I know that I should uh, shift until it's first on the buffer, then uh, add some arcs, and then add the, what I want. So in both cases, I kind of destroyed all of the um, middle, but I don't care about that. OK, yeah? So just to, just to make this explicit, you're assuming that every action is always OK uh, if it, under this, uh, in this language, if it's OK in any language. In other words, it, there's uh, never anything that prohibits you from linking J to M in this picture. 
Uh, yeah. I mean, no, some, some people, when they, in linguistics, if they write dependency grammars, will say, okay, these kinds of uh, parts of speech are allowed to link to these kinds, and those kinds are not allowed to link to those kinds. Uh, and you have no restriction. Yeah, so uh, currently I'm under this uh, system of uh, transition, and everything which is allowed there is allowed. And the question is, uh, can I have a sequence that will end up uh, in this structure, and I don't care about the middle at all? Okay, uh, and that's what makes the uh, the problem easy. Okay, because I don't care about this at all. Okay. And yeah, just to clarify, at this point you are simply talking reachability. You're not asking what is the most likely sequence of actions. No, no. Result yeah, I is there a sequence that will do that? Yeah. yeah. And, and then, of course, one can build on it and say yeah, that, but that sequence likely is possible. Yeah, but uh, now I don't have any weights or anything. Just yeah. like the the system, can I reach this or not? Can just Reason about the, 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 the system as a system. Okay. Uh, so to summarize, these are the rules. Uh, you can verify that they are very uh, easy to, to check. Okay. I can, uh, in fact, uh, check those uh, in O of 1 and a very fast O of 1. Okay. Uh, and so that's kind of. Uh, no, no. So, so these are the rules, right? So, like, uh, if the arc uh, is, is uh, already there, then it's okay, uh, and, I, and I, this is kind of a hash lookup. Yeah, and then uh, I, I need either uh, both uh, M and H are on the buffer, which is easy to check, uh, or uh, one of them is stuck and the other is on the buffer, which is also easy because I can track what I have where. The scanning was just to demonstrate to us that there is a... Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Checking is simpler. Yeah, okay. okay. So that's uh, very simple to check. Okay, it's uh, all, all of one, very, very simple checks. Uh, and, and I can uh, come up with a similar kind of scanning thing uh, for any uh, system, basically, and it will always do kind of like a very easy solution. Okay, so this is kind of an easy problem. Of course, it's not really an interesting one. Uh, and the more interesting problem is what I call the arc set reachability, which basically states, so I'm in a configuration, I have a set of arcs, uh, can I derive all of them together? Or can I have a, a, a structure with, with all of them? And that's a much, a much harder question uh, to answer. Uh, and it's harder because, well, that one was easy because I didn't care about the interactions. Okay, I, I was just able to build stuff and just to get to where I want. Here I really do care about the interaction. Okay, so I want to know if these things can kind of live peacefully together. Uh, so this is a much harder problem. In, in order to uh, to, to uh, solve that, I will introduce this um, new uh, property, uh, which I like to call. Well, like it is a bit of a strong word. I don't really like this name, so I, I'm looking for better names if you could find them uh, for me. But uh, this property, which I call uh, arc decomposition, okay, uh, and uh, this uh, property uh, is a, a property of of systems of a transition system, uh, which states that uh, if a set of arcs are individually reachable, then any subset of them which can be extended to form a, a valid tree is also reachable together. Okay, so that's kind of a very strong property, uh, but, but it's a very nice one. Okay, it means that if I can uh, reach all of these, uh, then I will also uh, be, be able to reach all of them together, okay, which is a very nice uh, thing to have. Um, so one sad consequence uh, is that the ARC standard system, which is a system I really use to like, uh, is not uh, decomposable in this sense. Okay, so there, uh, if I can uh, set, uh, if I can reach um, two ARCs individually, uh, there is definitely a case where I cannot reach both of them together. Because that's a very uh, easy counterexample uh, to show. On the other hand, uh, the good news is many other systems uh, with the ARC Eagle system and the ARC hybrid, which is very similar to the ARC standard, and the easy first, which is uh, mine, uh, are all ARC decomposable, okay, which, uh, for which this uh, property does hold, which is very nice. Uh, and uh, this property basically allows us uh, for many systems to reason in terms, or to work in terms of reachable ARCs, uh, but to reason about reachable structures, which is much more interesting. Okay? So the first claim is actually a little tricky, right? What you're saying is that there is a set of arcs which are all individually reachable, 
and there's a subset of them which is even consistent with a projective tree. Yeah. And yet, uh, that set is not reachable. And there's a configuration from which each of the individuals are reachable, and the set is not reachable. Yes. Uh, and yeah, where is the board? Right. Oh, that's okay. Uh, so for the arc standard system, uh, if you know it, then great. If you don't know it, just believe me. Okay. Uh, so let's assume uh, that's the uh, configuration. So we have the stack with three items. Okay. Uh, so um, this arc is reachable uh, by uh, adding this arc and, and like removing this guy and then adding that arc. Can you see from there? It's all good. Uh, this, one, this arc is reachable by just doing the select action, uh, but you cannot reach both of them together. Uh, because in order to, uh, to reach this one, you have to yeah, move the other one. Okay, so that's uh, why it doesn't work for the arc standard system. Um, but we can prove that this will never happen for the other systems, which is uh, a nice thing to, to know about them. Uh, and this basically gives us uh, an algorithm for our constraint parsing. Uh, so for any arc decomposable system. Okay, so if our system is arc decomposable, uh, basically uh, if we have a constraint set which is projective, meaning basically that it's satisfiable, so there are no kind of uh, uh, conflicts in our uh, constraints, uh, then if we can derive all of the individual arcs in the uh, constraint set, we can derive all of it, which is good. Uh, so all we need to do is stay in configuration from which all of the arcs in the uh, constraint set are reachable. Um, so it's very easy to, uh, to define this uh, set of, of uh, allowed action with respect to uh, configuration and some arcs, okay? Uh, and so it basically go, go, goes like that. So you are in a configuration, you apply the action, you see your new configuration, and you check uh, what are the reachable arcs from that new configuration, which is uh, easy to check. Uh, and if it's a superset of the ones you want, then this action is allowed, otherwise it is not. Okay, so this is kind of a declarative uh, definition, but um, you can believe me that uh, there is a very efficient way to just uh, uh, implement that uh, as queries. So I can ask, is this question, is this uh, action allowed or not uh, in this configuration with this set of uh, arcs, and I can get the answer very, very quickly. Okay, um, so, but that's the like set uh, I, am, uh, I am interested in. And once I have this uh, set, I can actually uh, have this uh, arc constraint parsing algorithm, which is basically uh, the uh, parsing algorithm as, as before, uh, with this um, addition that if my uh, action which I uh, chosen is not allowed uh, in this configuration and, and with these constraints, I just uh, choose the next best prediction for my classifier. Okay, uh, and it's kind of easy to show uh, that first I can uh, do this. Uh, very efficiently, and also uh, that uh, if I have good constraints, which are kind of just consistent, uh, then this set will never be empty, okay? Uh, just kind of by, by definition, actually, uh, and I will always be able to find a good action. Okay. Uh, so what do we have so far? Uh, we can calculate uh, the reachable arcs from any configuration, kind of easy to do. Uh, we define this uh, property uh, which holds for the arc eagle system, and uh, we have an arc constraint pattern algorithm which holds for any system uh, for which this property holds, in, in particular the arc eagle system which we actually use. Okay, so that's kind of a nice thing, but I think we can uh, do more than that. Okay, so let's see what else we can do with this, um, with this knowledge uh, of how the, the system works. So for that, let's just take one more look at training. Okay, so here is the, uh, the, uh, the training algorithm. And one thing I don't like about it uh, is this line, okay? Uh, and this line uh, is bad because the oracle will produce one static uh, sequence, okay? One single sequence uh, of action to follow, but in practice there may be more than one sequence of action that will uh, lead to, to a goal three, yeah. Well, I have a question sort of before you Sure. You have a, you know, you're going to be scoring these actions and choosing the top action. Yeah. And so, I 
I guess the question is, um, it seems like you might be, you could have ruled out some actions earlier by saying, okay, at this point, if I was to choose the top action, oh, actually, maybe I've seen that this won't happen. So I guess the question is, if you were to say score a, a sequence of actions by, I don't know what it would be, the sum of the model scores at each mm -hmm. time step, um, doing the, what you're doing to, your way of constraining things, is that guaranteed to say produce the... The most likely thing? No, yeah. it's not. Uh, but, uh, so under this kind of greedy regime, it's really hard uh, to guarantee any kind of optimality in the future. Uh, and it's up to the training to try and produce a good result in the future, okay? Um, because you're not allowed to search, you're not allowed to change anything, and you just kind of have to get like good kind of heuristics on what the future is going to be like, okay, if you want that. Uh, this one? So this thing about uh, the allowed actions is never empty. Yeah. Right? You'd have to essentially ask if in the configuration where the entire string is in the buffer and nothing is in the stack, you would have to ask whether there is any allowed action. Because right there, if there is no allowed action, it means A is an inconsistent set of yeah, I think it'd be the other way around. And you would stop. Right? Everything's on the stack and nothing's left in the buffer. No, no, I, I, no, no, I no, think. No. Before you, in other words, how do I you know whether A is a decent set? Okay, so, yeah, so if, it's, so if A is projective, okay, so I assume that the, the user gives you a set which is uh, projective. If you want to actually verify that it is projective, uh, I think it's a cubic algorithm. Uh, but right, actually, I was concerned about that, to check whether A is actually projective. And what I was thinking is that... No, 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 actually, it, it, it is actually very, very easy to also check that. You just kind of connect all of them together uh, and see if you can uh, build a tree on top with everything else allowed. And it's usually, it's, it's very easy to, it's easy to verify. I don't have the algorithm, but it's, it's easy. Like, if you have just uh, one allowed head for each word or, or, or all of them, uh, it's very easy to see if this is uh, projective or not. Okay? One thing you can do is use a graph This is all there. No, this is not just a table. No, no, that's, that, that's at the uh, inference time, but no, but uh, this uh, question is actually much easier uh, than the one uh, for which you need actual inference uh, because you know that each, like, so your constraints allow or either a single or all of the words for each. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah, so the next thing. Uh, so as I said, uh, this thing is bad because we have uh, what we call uh, spurious ambiguity. So let me give you. What's that? In the Mark standard, is there uh, still spurious ambiguity? Yes, there is. is there? Yeah, I can show it to you later. Um, so let me give you an example of that. So uh, here's a sentence. He wrote here a letter. Uh, so we start by shifting left, shift, right. And then we can do either a shift or a reduce. Okay? Uh, and then we can do either a shift or a left. And then we can do either a left or a reduce. And now we're kind of in the uh, same state in both. Um, in both regression, so we just uh, continue to the right, and then uh, we are done. But now we have to kind of ask ourselves which sequence is better. Okay, so well, they are both equally good because they both got uh, to, the, uh, to the correct answer. So they are both equally good. May want to ask like which sequence is easier to learn? Okay, if I'm trying to, to learn these things. And what people usually uh, currently do uh, is they uh, create oracles uh, in which they always prefer a shift if you have a shift reduce conflict. Okay? Uh, and the reason they do that is that they tried both ways and one of them uh, was mostly slightly better than the other. Okay? So kind of like just see what works best and then stick with that. Okay? Um, so it's kind of a good way uh, to go but if you just want to uh, have good accuracy but uh, maybe we should just let the classifier uh, choose either of them based on context. So I don't want um, to say that I always do this for that. I just like see what's more, most natural to me and then use it, okay? Um, and basically what I want to do is uh, replace uh, these two lines in the algorithm uh, with this, okay? So uh, I don't have a sequence anymore. I have this like Oracle object, okay, which is uh, initialized based on the sentence in the tree. Uh, and now, after I uh, have an, um, I have a prediction, I ask, uh, is it allowed based on the oracle? So kind of like uh, 
dynamic query, and if it's not allowed, then I take my goal to be the uh, highest scoring allowed one and update toward that. Okay, so I don't, so I no longer um, comparing to a static single action. I am comparing to a set of actions, okay, uh, and I update toward the best allowed action in this set. Okay, so that's the new training algorithm, uh, and of course the uh, question is. Okay, but how I can find this uh, oracle that will tell me what is allowed and what is not allowed? Okay, uh, and actually now I have a very simple answer uh, for that. That's just a very special case of uh, our constraint parsing uh, with very extreme constraints. Okay, so basically we need to make sure uh, at each stage that the goal tree uh, is reachable. Okay, uh, so this basically means uh, that we just uh, take the uh, set of allowed arcs to be all the gold arcs. Okay, so we have a very kind of a strong set of constraints, but it will allow all of the paths that lead to the gold tree. Okay, and I uh, uh, have already an uh, algorithm for that, so that's kind of easy to solve. Okay, and as a bonus, this also works if I have only a partial observation is, is my uh, constraint. So now I can uh, also kind of train with a partial constraint set, which is not a full tree. So that's kind of a new thing that I can do now in this framework, which I got uh, f for free just by changing how the uh, training works. But let's uh, assume that I uh, do train with all of the gold arcs, okay? so no partial uh, constraints. Um, actually, it works pretty good. So I get some improvement uh, across all data sets, almost. Okay? There is a slight, slight drop here, but I would not count this uh, as a drop. Uh, so there is kind of a... a consistent gain uh, across all, all, all data sets. The numbers are kind of what we would expect from a small change in a parsing system. Uh, slightly better, but like nothing uh, spectacular. So 0.5 uh, max improvement, uh, quarter point average improvement. So it's kind of consistent and nice. It's, and it seems to work pretty well. Uh, if you uh, move to the like multilingual uh, setting, then it sometimes works very well. Uh, sometimes it works uh, less well, and it, there is some drop in Chinese and a large drop in, in Hungarian. I have no idea why there is this drop in Hungarian. If anyone here speaks Hungarian and would like to help me analyze the results, I'd be happy to. Uh, but basically, if you want to like, sum, sum this up, it's mostly beneficial. Okay? Um, so it would, it's nice to kind of uh, train with this uh, ambiguity allowance. Uh, but we're not there yet, so now let's take one more look. At our, uh, at our modified learning algorithm. And the other line, or the other part I don't like about that uh, is this part, okay? Uh, so this part basically means uh, that if I made a mistake, I choose uh, one allowed action and I use that, okay? And w what this means basically is I always follow a correct action and the training algorithm will never see um, configuration that resulted uh, from incorrect actions, okay? So you might ask, okay, so why is that a bad thing? Uh, and that's a bad thing uh, because uh, the training is attempting to learn the optimal action for each configuration, uh, but there's also kind of an assumption here, uh, which is that all of the previous action were correct, okay? So in training, I'm, I'm kind of having this, uh, this uh, scenario in which I made many good predictions, and now I need to make one more prediction and what's the best prediction is. But of course, in parsing time, uh, we may make a mistake, okay? Uh, and after we made a mistake in parsing time, this assumption that everything was true up to this point uh, no longer holds, okay? Uh, so we may reach a state that we haven't seen before, and then we'll have no idea what to do and we kind of uh, generalize from other states completely. Or we may reach a state that we have seen before, uh, but under uh, uh, different assumption, and maybe there is uh, something better to do here if we assume that we may have uh, got here due to wrong reasons. Okay, so we really do need to account for that. So the underlying thing is basically always try to make training condition as similar as possible to testing conditions. That's a good rule to follow if you want to just take one sentence from this uh, presentation. Yes? So, so maybe it's worth uh, mentioning Dagger here? It's very similar to Dagger. I'll touch on that. Okay. Okay, in the future. Uh, so what we need to, to do uh, is to expose the parsers to, to configurations 
uh, that resulted uh, from bad decisions or from errors. And also, I need to uh, tell it what is the optimal thing to do uh, in this configuration. Uh, and basically, that's the hard part, okay? Because it may not be clear, actually, what is the optimal thing to do. Okay, so I made a mistake. Now I should do something, but what should I do? Like, I should do the best thing, and I don't know what the best thing is. Um, but let me try to give you a reasonable definition of what the best thing is, or this thing which I think is reasonable. Um, so it's basically this definition. Uh, so if the goal tree is reachable, so I haven't made any mistakes, I want to reach the goal tree. That's, that's kind of given. Uh, and if the goal tree is not reachable, then I want to be able to reach um, the best reachable tree. Okay, so I cannot reach my goal, but maybe I can reach a tree which is very similar to it, and then I want to reach that. Okay? Um, so what's the best reachable tree? Uh, it's basically, in, in my definition, uh, is the tree with the, <coughs> with the uh, smallest humming loss to the gold tree. Okay? Uh, and... Can I ask you a question, though? Yeah, sure. So you're saying that there is a sequence of actions that I'm thinking right now where you produce a single or a sequence of actions. Yeah. And then you can say you made a mistake. Yeah. The gold tree is still reachable. No, no. This must be one of those curious ambiguities, right? Because otherwise, a mistake would mean that. Yeah. So no. So so this actually means uh, no mistake. Okay. Okay. Uh, or like either mistake with uh, with both ambiguity or no mistakes. So we have something like mistake. no mistake here. Yeah. So in other words, when you make a real mistake, the goal tree is no longer. Yes. Mistake. Yes. Okay. Because um, that's how I define mistakes. Okay. Um, but, uh, but uh, if I made a mistake and the gold tree is not reachable, I want to reach the best reachable tree. The minimum hammer Yeah, or the mi minimum hammer loss. Basically, um, the, the tree with the most gold edges which are still reachable. So, so now you know, okay, so at least naively it looks like I'll have to enumerate all the trees reachable from this erroneous state and then choose them. Yeah, but so actually, fortunately, because I have this uh, arc decomposition thing, Okay, I can just take the union of the gold tree and the reachable arcs. I see, just treat it as a set. Yeah. Okay. And then, because I know that everything that uh, can be built from this arc is reachable as a tree, I know that the best tree, okay, is there. So that's kind of uh, the, the neat uh, trick over here. And actually, a very uh, small tweak to our oracle will make it behave optimally uh, for any configuration under this um, optimality criteria. Uh, and it will also allow us to return a cost for each action uh, at a configuration. So for, each, uh, so for each action at a configuration, I will know exactly which, which arcs are no longer reachable, which is a very nice thing to, so to have. first time or any time you make a mistake, so you basically have past actions, you know which arcs in the gold tree you lost because of the mistake. Yes. There are others that you got, and then of the remaining, you just see uh, which subset is the, the reachable. Basically. Yeah. Or rather, yeah, which, okay. Okay. You, you have to test them only one at a time. Yes. Because if they're reachable one at a time, then that's the set A, and then any yes. subset is through the gate. So. Precisely. Okay. Uh, so just kind of to uh, slightly elaborate on that. So I'll define the cost of an action at a configuration uh, to be the number of gold arcs that are are reachable from a configuration, but are, but are not reachable after taking the action. This is very easy. Uh, to, uh, to calculate, and then under this uh, definition, optimal actions have a cost of zero, and there is always, by definition, an optimal action with a, with a cost of zero, okay? because it's kind of the way it's defined. Uh, and here's like an, a, a quick quiz. Uh, basically, let's assume that in the gold arc, uh, there is no, in the gold tree, there is no arc between a head and a modifier. Uh, is there an optimal action that will add this arc? And the question is yes, there is. Uh, and it basically means that, like, if uh, yeah, I made a mistake uh, and I cannot uh, and I cannot find the the right parent for this modifier, I might as well choose a different parent if it doesn't kind of uh, break other things down the line. Okay, so it's kind of uh, maybe a bit counterintuitive, uh, but kind of that falls out of this uh, system and it is correct. Okay, um, so basically what I'm going to do. Uh, is I'm going to change uh, or uh, replace this line uh, with this. Uh, so sometimes I follow the gold action, other times I follow the uh, one which I just visited, uh, uh, which may be wrong. And now my uh, oracle is optimal uh, and it will give me the best thing to do 
um, if I'm wrong. Okay, so now I can I kind of do this kind of uh, exploration in, in training. Um, and if you kind of uh, know the CERN algorithm or the Dagger algorithm, uh, then this uh, should look very familiar uh, to you, okay? Um, and it should because the, um, uh, basically our new Oracle, which is optimal for, for every configuration, is a very good policy uh, in the uh, CERN ser sense of what the policy is, okay? Uh, and earlier attempts uh, to use uh, CERN for parsing um, failed just because they didn't have this uh, uh, policy component. Okay, so now there is a policy component and it actually, I definitely believe that using CERN with that will work, but my algorithm is very, very similar. It's actually, you can see my algorithm is in like an online dagger thing, uh, which I kind of believe I have the same guarantees as dagger, I just didn't prove it yet. But it should be very, I mean, I'm not really, I don't really care about proving it, but if you want to prove it, go ahead and be happy to see a, a proof. Uh, anyways, if you do that, uh, that the kind of training, you get really kind of a nice uh, improvement in scores. Okay, so uh, here it's actually something which is really visible. Uh, so we get an average improvement of one point, uh, max improvement of uh, 1.4, uh, which is really kind of uh, meaningful. Actually, the number are slightly higher. These are kind of uh, results with a bug, and I was uh, lazy uh, to uh, uh, change the graph, but uh, results are a bit higher. Uh, it's nice that the bug actually, like fixing the bug, actually got us to go higher and not lower. That's a uh, nice thing about the algorithm. Actually, yes? Um, so it basically corrects things across the board. I mean, it's kind of hard to kind of pinpoint just one kind of mistake that it uh, is better at. Uh, but uh, so, well, one kind of mistake that is much better at is like root attachment. So it's uh, make much less, uh, many fewer uh, root attachment uh, mistakes. Uh, but also many other kinds of mistakes uh, are just better, but I cannot say like a particular one. Uh, it doesn't quite help with, with people attachment. Uh, but it definitely helps across the board. Yes? So I'm going to assume that because you're doing more exploration, you're creating new features during training, so it's probably slower than the, the original version? Is, is more, is it has more memory? Is that more stuff to consider? Uh, it is a bit slower, but, uh, but not by a substantial amount. I mean, we have more features, and now kind of we have a larger feature vector. Uh, but uh, if we have the same feature set for both models, uh, then the difference is kind of very negligible. If you do use the same feature set, do you still see the same gains? Or is this a matter of... These are with the same feature set. Okay, I... No, so I, I didn't change uh, feature sets here. Oh, so if you do, like, include new features from configurations, you know, during your exploration phase, you, you might see even larger gains. Like, I think the same thing happens in graph-based parsing where... So, I don't really... Under, so. Uh, it's the same feature templates, okay, uh, which may produce many more features, okay, but it's the same uh, kind of set of, uh, uh, like, whatever templates I'm using. So uh, there are, like, newer features, uh, but they are not kind of newer kinds of features, okay? So, yeah, nice results here. Uh, also, for other languages, I get uh, very similar gains. Um, if something kind of drops for Chinese, uh, you, you get it back up, so it's nice. Hungarian, still annoying. Uh, but less so. Actually, in the new version, this uh, gap here is much smaller. So Hungarian now is kind of still a bit worse, but like really by a tiny margin after fixing my uh, previous bug. Uh, but still, I mean, it's annoying that it's not there, and I would like to know why Hungarian behaves so uh, so badly. But overall, this thing works. I mean, it, these are really nice results in my in my view. Um, so just to kind of sum it up, concrete things we now have is we have uh, parsing with R constraints, which I've uh, shown you. Uh, we have in a kind of different work parsing with span constraints, which is a bit more tricky, uh, but in the same kind of spirit of things. Uh, we have this oracle, which is optimal uh, for every state uh, and can work with partial observations. We can actually train with partial uh, observations. Uh, and we have uh, more accurate deterministic parsing, which is kind of a very nice new result. Um, and if we think of what we didn't know before, and now we can actually answer this question. So how does an action affect the, the, the set of reachable structure? Well, uh, for these uh, decomposable the systems, uh, it will remove all the structure that contain the set of arcs 
which are lost by the action. Okay? Uh, and what is the set of structures uh, reachable from any configuration? Well, it's the, um, all of the structure which can be built from reachable arcs. Okay? Uh, and what does, shift, what does shift mean? So in the arc ecosystem, shift basically means the token on the buffer uh, is done with all of its uh, left modifiers uh, and is uh, really expecting a head to its right. Okay, so now we kind of really know uh, what is uh, going on with the uh, shift operation. Uh, there are various things we can uh, do with this, but I do not want to limit your creativity, so I'll skip that. Uh, and I'll uh, let you read uh, this uh, take home message where I take questions. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so I don't think you showed results for this. So I, when you first introduced these constraints, I thought you were, act you were going to go to the setting where you had constraints on the parts. Um, and then you were going to I mean, you use them for something else, but have you looked at uh, applications where you do have constraints that you know from outside of the parse and that you can actually use this? Uh, yeah, we do have these kind of applications uh, at Google. It's kind of hard to measure them. But, le but let's say uh, we have a very good entity recognizer. Uh, so we know that like, some spans must be uh, entities, and we just want our parse to be uh, consistent with that. Uh, so now we run this uh, span concept algorithm and we get that uh, for free, basically. Um, for our constraints, there are uh, some uh, situations, uh, maybe a bit, a bit artificial, but say uh, in uh, Japanese, if you know the bunsetsus, you know uh, several arcs, uh, so we can just use that uh, and, and do it. Uh, in terms of uh, training with our constraints, um, I started to uh, explore that, but I don't have any concrete results yet. But uh, basically, the motivation for the constraints was various things that we do at Google, uh, which are harder to measure, but we just need things to be consistent. So, well, uh, hmm? I have a question. If you go back to the last algorithm-like slide where you were looking at uh, the, yeah, this one. Okay. Yeah. So sometimes you do something, sometimes I guess this involves some kind of sampling, right? Are you doing it, or are you doing it something, something? Uh, so I can just tell you what I, yeah. what I do. Uh, so basically, in the first round of training of the uh, training set, I just always take the one I predicted. Okay. okay? Uh, sorry, uh, the gold one. Oh, yeah, just to kind of get kind of to a good state. After that, uh, I basically uh, flip a coin, and 90% uh, of the times I pick the one I predicted. So it's mostly exploration. Uh, but of course, uh, the one I uh, did predict might be correct. So I mean. Uh, and uh, changing this number doesn't really affect the scores that much. Uh, I mean, if it's uh, much lower, so if I hardly do any exploration, like if it's 0.2 or 0.3, then uh, it's worse results. Uh, but if it's uh, 0.9, 0.8, uh, 0.95, even 1, I get very stable results there. So it's kind of, uh, you, you should explore as much as possible, basically. One was to, like, you know, your predictor probably gives you some probabilities on the actions, not just that this is the best, this is the second. Oh, not really, but so it but could. Okay, it could. Uh, so I was thinking, one, that whether you would sample based on that, saying that if the correct action is highly likely, then you just you know, sample, so basically sample according to that probability distribution, and so most of the time you'll be sampling the correct action where it's going to be chosen, and yeah, and so, so it's uh, sort of similar because um, uh, the, I, I choose the action, like the gold action, uh, which is uh, the most um, highly ranked by my current scoring function. So it's uh, kind of more, more determinist than what you suggest. I just never choose the like, uh, lower ranked one, but it's very yeah, similar. Um, that's a very good suggestion, and I kind of thought about that, but I don't have anything concrete there yet. Do you have some sense of which are the most problematic decisions in this setting where 
or the most problematic that this one's correct? Um, I know in answer to another question from uh, Adam, you said that the improvements are all over the place. I do not have a good answer that to this one uh, currently, uh, but I am looking at um, kind of what's happening there. But I don't have anything, anything kind of uh, concrete or meaningful uh, to say at this point. I will have in the future. So. I, mean, you know, I know from talking to my parsing friend, I'm not a parser, uh, that uh, <laughs> one of you know, these uh, uh, three attachments over a long distance kind of problem and then coordinated conjunctions are often problems. Yeah. That, do, does this uncover that? This uncovers some kinds of, um, I mean, we do see gains uh, in uh, conjunctions, but I mean, we also see gains in, in other things. As I said, the PP attachment uh, is less uh, solved by that, but, but that's because, well, in this system, uh, when you commit to a PP attachment, you cannot really recover from that. Uh, actually, you can just so, do having made a wrong attachment. Yes. Which actually might often be easy to do anyway, yeah. So, like, uh, basically, if you uh, decided so that something that something uh, is a uh, determiner, even though it's uh, like a relative, like a relativizer, then you can just ignore that and add one more uh, determiner and do something on top, which is kind of. Yeah, it's a, it's a definitely very interesting, and I did think about that. Like, basically, uh, have some scores for all of the uh, possible arcs, and then base that in, in heuristic. The problem here in Google setup uh, is that this will actually require you to look at all of the arcs, which is again expensive. But I do want to look at that, uh, like in two months when I leave Google. And Yeah, yeah, it's... Consider with them within a beam or something. Yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah, there are many things that you can, you can uh, uh, do, and I will definitely, yeah, we should talk about that more.